Well, they need to give me hand signals from the, from the sound booth. So, If you have your Bibles and want to follow with me, I'm going to be reading a text from Matthew chapter 25, the first 13 verses. I'm continuing in my series on Jesus Christ as our coming King. I'm working my way through the, what the Alliance calls the fourfold gospel. I've already talked about Jesus as our Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and now I'm on our coming King. Um, I haven't put on my teacher's hat yet. That's probably going to be in the next message where I start talking about some of the details that will happen at the end times. But today's message, I want to talk about being ready. Are we ready for Jesus to come as our coming king? Again, the text is in Matthew chapter 25, the first 13 verses. You can read in your Bible or watch it on the screen as well. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins, who were ready, went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. May God bless the, the reading of his word, and welcome to all of you that are here, welcome to those that are watching online. We have several people that faithfully watch us online. So if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, send us a message. We'd love to hear where you're listening from. It's fun getting those comments each week on uh, where people are listening to this service from. But welcome, and we're glad that you're a part of Crown Alliance Church today. At Crown, we invite people to come, grow, and go. We want to invite people to come because we, we, we believe we have a message that can radically change their life now and affect their eternal destiny. So we want people to come so we can share the good news. But then once they come, we hope people grow. We hope people understand Jesus a little bit more after spending time at Crown so they can look to God to help them through life and whatever things that they face. But then the go part. Uh, the church just doesn't happen inside the walls of this building. We're the church wherever we go. So we pray that you take what we, what we share here, what you've grown in as your faith grows, and then that you could go where, wherever you go, you would be a representative of Jesus there. So uh, thank you for joining us at Crown Alliance to come grow and go. Before I get into my message, let me just bow for a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for the, the opportunity to live in a country that allows us to worship, to go to our places of worship, to worship you openly and freely. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for this church, this church that's been a part of ministry in Cortland since 1936. Many pastors have come and gone. Many people have walked through the doors of this church, and this church has seen many lives radically changed because of your great grace. We thank you for that ministry. Lord, I pray that you would be with the city of Cortland. I pray that this church would continue to, to have an impact in this town, that we could see lives changed and, and things radically changed 
because people come to know you as their personal Savior. But Lord, we pray for this country as a whole with all the things that are going on. Lord, anytime we, we pick up our devices, anytime we, we look at the news, we look at social media, there's, there's plenty of things to, to get us depressed, to get us down, to get us overwhelmed. But Lord, we stand here today saying that we serve a God that is still on the throne, that is still in control. And Lord, we will not give up. We will not surrender. We will keep telling the good news of Jesus to as many people as we can. Lord, I pray for our leaders. I pray for our president. I pray for the, the congressmen and the senators. I pray for the governors of our states. I pray for all the, the leaders that are in, in place. Lord, I pray that you would give them wisdom give them conviction, give them courage. Lord, I pray that they would, would stand up for, for what they believe to be right, and I, pl I pray that they, what they believe to be right would be in line with your word. Lord, again, we thank you for this church. I thank you for everybody that has supported this church faithfully, whether it's through dropping their tithes and offerings in the box on the back wall or sending it in digitally or people that mail it in. Lord, I thank you for the people that sacrificially give to support this church. And Lord, may we be faithful in using the monies that come in to advance the kingdom of God. And Lord, our, our desire is to increase the future population of heaven and decrease the population of hell. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful in doing ministry for you. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, I had to laugh for those of you that are in service. During one of our songs, you saw the screens go black and say no signal. Um, technology is wonderful. Uh, but I want you to know it doesn't just refer to technology. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I'll be speaking and you'll see my face just kind of go black because I lose my place. So I guess I'm kind of like technology. Bear with me sometimes as I try to struggle through. But if I was to mention the date to you of December 7th, 1941, would that mean anything to you? Maybe if I add the phrase, a date which will live in infamy, maybe that'll clear it up a little bit more. Those words were given by then President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as he was addressing a joint session of Congress on December 8th, 1941, just the day before, on the 7th, was when Japan had bombed Pearl Harbor. Surprise attack, killed many people, massive destruction done. America had tried to remain neutral on World War II, didn't want to get involved. We wanted to, to stay out of it. But because of Japan's aggression, it changed everything. The term infamy means a state of being well known for some bad quality or bad deed. President Roosevelt was saying Japan will always be remembered for that day of evil that was rained down on the United States of America with that attack on Pearl Harbor. But I'm not going to talk about the evil that happened on that day. What I want to talk about is being prepared for a catastrophic event like that. Now, I, I'm not a historian. I don't claim to be one. But I do understand that there had been some warnings of that attack coming. Radar was a relatively new technology. It was so new that they had it, but they kind of used it. And the, from what some of the things that I've read, the radar room might be open for certain hours. And then they just shut the power off and go home. And people didn't know if they really trusted this new technology. So when two people reported that they, what they saw on the radar scope, didn't really get anyone's attention. Needless to say, things may have been different if our military had been ready. If we had a warning, 
we were on guard, things may have been different. Today, I want to talk about the warning that we're given to be ready for the second coming of Jesus. And, and I guess I even need to change that. We need to be ready to meet Jesus. Jesus might come back while I'm still living and I'll meet him in the air. I'm pretty cool with that. I'm, I'm excited. The, the Bible tells me that the dead in Christ will rise first. That, might, that means my dad's going to have a head start. But then the Bible says we're going to meet in the air. I'm okay with that. I'll meet Jesus that way. But my dad got to meet Jesus in a different way. Because his earthly life ended. So are we ready to meet Jesus when he comes back or if our life is ended today? Our text says, therefore, keep watch, because you don't know the day or the hour. We don't know when our last is going to be. As many of you have heard the story before. My dad came home from a day of work, started getting his lunch ready for the next day. It was Monday. He was getting his lunch ready for Tuesday, put it in the refrigerator, never made it to Tuesday morning. He met Jesus way earlier than any of us wished he would have. So to, to, to get this point across that Jesus wants to get, he, he used a story, and, and Jesus was a, a master storyteller. I have a, a pastor friend that I've asked to, to mentor me, and he used to, he, he would listen to my message the recorded message, and then Monday or Tuesday following that, he would call me and kind of critique my message on how I was preaching. And, you know, when you're a preacher, you want the guy who's mentoring you to say, boy, you knocked it out of the park. That was great. I didn't always get that from my mentor. Uh, his name was John Sherholtz. He used to be on district staff. But one thing I like about John Sherholtz is he... he and he tried to encourage me to focus on, your, on an opening illustration. Something that will get people's attention to kind of set the table for the meal that you're going to be giving them. And John was very good at that. I loved his illustrations and the way he preached. But then I think of Jesus. I mean, I, I don't think John would be offended if I told him that I think Jesus did a little better job than he did. And I know Jesus did a lot better job than I do. Jesus was a master storyteller. And in this case, he's using a cultural illustration to provide a serious warning. If you can relate something that's going on right now to the message that you want to deliver, you've already got people in the palm of your hand because they know what you're talking about. So here's a quick lesson in Jewish culture. On the night of a wedding, the groom would leave his house, go with his groomsmen. They would walk over to his future bride's house late in the evening. The bride would already be there. She would have ten, as the, the Bible says, ten virgins or ten unmarried women were with her. They were her bridesmaids. And they would be watching. They knew, that, they knew this was the day. But they'd be watching for the groom to come. When they saw him, they would take their torches, go out and meet the bridegroom, and then bring him in. They'd have the wedding ceremony there at the bride's house. They'd exchange their vows. But then the bridesmaids again would take their torches and lead the procession back to the groom's house where they would have the wedding banquet. Since all that happened at night, the torches were a key part of this. They led the procession. So that's, that's what the story is that Jesus used to say, all right, be ready. Be ready to meet Jesus. Have your torches lit and ready. For the sake of the explanation of the parable, the bridegroom is going to represent Jesus. I, I don't know if you know this about me, but I've never been a bride but I'm pretty sure 
that in that scenario, the bride was peeking out the window. Is he coming? Is he coming? Is he coming? He's ready. He's excited. I, I can use my example as a guy, and especially as a pastor, any wedding that I've ever performed, and I, I tell every groom this before the wedding, I said when the, the bridesmaids walk in, they have the cute little flower girl dropping the petals all the way up in this, but then when the doors open up for the bride to walk in, everybody turns and looks to the bride, not me as a pastor. I turn and look towards the groom. Because if the groom is going to pass out, that is going to be when it happens. When he sees his beautiful bride in her wedding gown coming down the aisle, and, and I've, I've, never had, I've never had a groom go down, but I've done the wedding for a couple people that were in the military, and I could see their training come in on how they were taught how to not keep their legs stiff and because you'd end up passing out. One, one I remember specifically just after <sighs> some deep breaths. The excitement of what was going to happen. The bride's peeking out. The bridesmaids are peeking out. He's coming. He's coming. We're going to go out and bring him in. The virgins, so the, the bridegroom is Jesus. The virgins represent people. I'm, I'm going to put it this way. I believe the virgins represent people that believe that they're going to be going to heaven that are living before the second coming of Jesus. Now, some people believe the virgins represent the church, which I think we can use that illustration, but I think it's even broader than that. Because there are a lot of people that believe, as long as they believe in a God, any little G-O-D, they're going to go to heaven. You've probably heard people make the statement, well, it doesn't really matter what God you serve. We're all going to go to heaven. So, can the virgins be more than just the church? I, I, I believe they can. Some of these people might not even claim to be a part of any church. They might flat out be against church. But if you ask them if they're going to heaven, they'll say, oh yeah, absolutely. So here we are, people that are expecting to go to heaven. That's what I'm going to say this group of virgins is made up. The ones that have no faith in anything in particular, but believe they're going to, going to go to heaven, I believe they've earned the title of the foolish ones. Uh, it's interesting. Again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on about parables. Don't, don't take parables too literally, because if we did, this would be awful generous. He says there's five foolish virgins and five wise ones. <laughs> As a preacher, I might get myself in trouble, but I've seen a lot more than 50% of the people that I wouldn't call wise. So we have some that believe they're going to go to heaven, want to go to heaven, but then we have the wise virgins, and these are what I would call sincere Christians. Now I could preach a series on what a sincere Christian is. We could go into great detail on what that means, but that's a term I'm going to use today, sincere Christians. In a different parable, these two groups of people are referred to differently as wise and foolish builders. Again, Jesus, the master storyteller, used a story that people could relate to. But the example of either, either the wise and foolish virgins or the wise and foolish builders, the goal is to be ready for the time when Jesus will come back for his church. That's the reason we're given this parable. As our text suggests, the wise virgins or sincere Christians will be the bearers of light. In the parable, they're going to take their torches out to bring in the bridegroom for the ceremony. But this idea of bearers of light, I believe, is spelled out in 1 Thessalonians 
chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. But you, brothers and sisters, again, talking about Christians, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all the children of light. Your torches are lit. They're burning bright. We don't know when Jesus is going to come back. And we don't know when we're going to breathe our last. But if we're a sincere Christian, it doesn't matter. We're ready. Our torches are lit. They're bright. An interesting fact that I, that I thought of when I was preparing this message. When Jesus returns, he's going to know the difference between the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. He's going to see the light, the children of light. He's going to see their lit torches. He's going to know who they are. They're going to follow him, and they're going to go to heaven. They're going to go to the wedding banquet. That's clear in the parable. But the other thing that I notice is the foolish virgins are also going to know who the wise virgins are. They're going to see the true light that the, the, sin, wow, the sincere Christian is given. Have you ever noticed there are people that will claim that there isn't a God? There are people that will claim to be an atheist. There will be people that claim to be agnostic. They don't, they don't even care if there's a God. But when they have a pressing need in their life, if they know you're a Christian, they're going to come and ask you to pray. Why? Because they know there's something different. So the foolish virgins, they're expecting to go to heaven. But when this tragic event happens, they know, they, they look towards the wise virgins, they look towards the sincere Christians and cry help. So Jesus will recognize the sincere Christian, because of their faith. But I believe the world will as well. I've had this experience happen to me many times as a trucker. I remember the one week, been running with this guy. We'd started out the week together. We were, it was Wednesday. We'd been loading and unloading at the same place. We're in the middle. It's pouring down rain. We're loading a load of lumber down in Kentucky. And all of a sudden, the guy looks at me and says, well, you're closer to God because you're a preacher, so I got some questions for you. People might say, well, I, I know you're a religious person. Will you pray for me? That's why we always need to be ready. Because Christians are the bearers of light, we need to keep our torches lit and have extra oil for as long as it takes until Jesus returns. Now, this extra oil, I'm going to get to that. I want to, I want to explain what that means. But as a sincere Christian, we need to be ready. And, and, and please don't get nervous. So many, so many people, so many well-meaning Christians say they, they get nervous. They don't want somebody to ask them about their faith because they don't have all the answers. Well, welcome to the crowd. I don't. I don't have all the answers. I plan on spending the rest of my life studying God's Word, and every year when I read through the Bible, I'm amazed at the verses that are in there that weren't there the year before. I never saw, I never knew that before. I want to continue to learn. It's not that you have all the answers, but you need to be ready when somebody asks a question. And you, you can be ready by just having that sincere faith. The danger that this parable represents is many people feel comfortable with their torches. Yeah, my, my torch is lit. It's giving me enough light. I'm going through life. I'm, I'm doing just fine. But their source of fuel isn't sufficient. When it comes to the hard times, when it comes to the difficult times, where does our faith rest? Now, I'm going to challenge you today. If your faith has never been tested, it will be. 
Let me say that again. If your faith has never been tested, it will be. There are times when, when things hit and we start to question, is this really real? Is God really there? I, why am I going through the things that I am? I, I don't think I can compare myself to Job in any way, but he, he wanted some answers when things were going bad. And this parable is saying, when those times hit, people are going to know that their little light that they're using to guide their path isn't enough to get them through. So the fuel, the, the, the oil that they were going to take is represented by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible uses oil to represent the Holy Spirit in a lot of different ways. In talking about Jesus as our healer, we talked about the anointing with oil. In the Old Testament, they anointed the person to be a king. It was representing the power and the presence of an almighty God. The only way we will be ready for the long haul will be because we're relying on the Holy Spirit for strength and help. Otherwise, when we're tested, our supply is going to wear out. To keep an adequate supply of oil or an adequate supply of the Holy Spirit, we need to keep filling ourselves with the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I try to pray, God, every day, God, help me. Help me with the struggles that I'm going to have today. You know the areas where I'm weak. You know the areas where Satan, he knows my last nerve and he jumps all over it all day long to try to get to me. God, I need your strength. I need your help. This can be seen in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of light. Are the children of God, sorry. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You want to be a sincere Christian? You want to be lumped into the, the wise builder or the wise virgin in this parable? Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. This idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, again, I'll, I'll stick true to my trucker background. I was thinking of the times that I would say that the well went down, the gas well went down that we were working on, so we just had to wait for that well to recover, the, to get up and running again. So I'd have to hang out in my truck. So I'd be in the sleeper of my truck, and I had everything I needed in my truck. I had a refrigerator. I had my little George Foreman grill. I could cook my meals in the sleeper. I could watch TV. I had old cases of CDs. Uh, kids, that, that are the little round things. Now used, everything's digital. but I could hang out in my sleeper of my truck, very comfortable. But if I did it too long... I'm going to drain the batteries for the truck. There were, and there were times, I, there was one week, the well was down for a week. So I lived in the sleeper of my truck for a week. But I would have to start the truck up to get the motor running, to get the generator running, to charge the batteries to keep me going. If I didn't do that, I'm going to drain the batteries. And there's times... I. A person could be sitting there watching their TV in the truck. Everything's fine. Enough power to run the TV. But then you get the call that you need to go to work. You jump in the driver's seat and you turn that key and you hear click, 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 click. There's enough battery. There's enough power in the battery to keep the TV going. But not enough power to turn that motor over. I believe the foolish virgins will be comfortable watching their TVs. Very happy. Just going through life. Wake up another day. Get dressed. Go through whatever you have to go through. Yeah, survived another day. We do the same thing tomorrow, only a little bit different. Watching their TV. But when they die, or when Jesus returns, there's not enough fuel to even get them off the ground. We need to be like the wise virgins that weren't relying on their own source 
of fuel. I think we get pretty good at doing this thing we call life. We feel pretty confident in ourselves. I got a good job. I'm making good money. Got a nice home, nice family. I lack for nothing. But then what happens when you turn the key? Where's your source of power? Where's your source of strength? Some people's faith in God is, and I've said this before, it's kind of like a fire insurance policy to keep you out of hell's fire. Your faith is, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I asked him to forgive my sins. That means I'm not going to hell. Whew. Job done. Check that off the checklist. But when in reality, the power that we need to live a godly life comes from the Holy Spirit. Without God's help, we're at best sitting in our sleeper watching TV, draining the batteries. At best. Without being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, we might be left outside knocking on the door when our life is over. I, I often say that that point will preach. I, that, that point makes a great message. Outside, knocking on the door. Choked me up when I even read that passage this morning. God leads the wise virgins away to the wedding banquet, shuts the door. The others come knocking on the door. Lord, Lord, here I am. Let me in. And he looks out and says, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't even know who you are. But I, I called you, Lord, Lord. But I, I taught Sunday school. Ooh, let me go a little bit dangerous area. I, I was a pastor. And God looks out and says, I, I don't even know who you are. Eternally stuck on this side of the door. The wise virgin's wisdom comes from their determination to keep their relationship with God fresh. How many people, how many marriages have you seen that fall apart? And people say, well, we just drifted apart because you weren't living together. You weren't trying to live together. How do you keep your relationship with God strong? Work at it. When times are tough, you hit your knees and pray. When times are good, you hit your knees and pray. In God's Word, studying. This is one of those times you might want to pull your feet under your chairs because the Holy Spirit has a tendency to jump on some toes. But how many times do we, at best, we pick up our Bibles on Sunday morning and wipe the dust off because it's been sitting there all week. You haven't touched it, but you got to look like a happy little Christian going to church with your Bible under your arm. I love the illustration. Pastor went over to a lady from church, went over to her house to visit her. So they're sitting in the living room, and the lady wanted to in, impress, that this is a dated illustration, I'm going to warn, warn you up front, but wanted to impress the pastor. So the lady said to her daughter, can you go in the other room? It's right on the coffee table. You know, the, the favorite book of mine, right on the coffee, can you bring it to me? The little girl runs into the other room to the coffee table and runs back with the Sears catalog. Now, again, catalog, kids, catalogs were books that had, no, I'm just kidding. Do we read our Bible? Do we even try to spend time staying close to God? The foolish virgin's faith is just simply for show. 
I'll never forget, I was in a pastor's promise keepers conference in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Georgia Dome. There's about 50,000 pastors in there. Awesome time, but the one that I remember is Dr. Tony Evans. He was up there speaking, and he's challenging this room full of pastors. Not, not just ordinary people. I mean, he was talking to pastors. But he said, how many times is our Christian faith, as we get up on Sunday morning, we reach over to our dresser, pick up our Christian smile, put it on our Christian face, go to the closet and get our good boy Christian clothes, get in our Christian car and drive to our Christian church, and walk in and everybody asks, how's it going? And you give your Christian lie that says everything's great when our world's falling apart. We may fool others temporarily with our little light display, with our torches as we watch our TV in our sleepers. But there's no source of fuel when it's really going to count. When we breathe our last or when Jesus Christ returns. And we don't know how long that's going to be. My dad shouldn't have died at 72. Had way too much living left to do. But he met Jesus that night. We don't know how long it's going to be. But will we be ready when it will really count? And to demonstrate this, let me use the phrase from our text, and the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Long time coming. Is your faith a long-term faith? Or are you just watching the TV hoping the battery lasts a little bit longer. Now, some people believe that's a condemnation for both groups. Both the wise virgins and the foolish virgins fell asleep. So that's clearly a con condemnation for both groups. But I believe it just simply represents it's a long time coming. Is your faith a long time faith are you that flashbang that you're excited when it happens and then you just kind of let it drain? It's interesting. The parable provides no discipline for the wise virgins. It doesn't say the bridegroom came and said, come on, you lazy virgins, what are you doing? You were drowsy, you were sleeping. No. The parable doesn't say that. They were drowsy and fell asleep because it was a long time coming. While we may become weary in waiting, there's a reason for the wait. I was thinking this back in when I was a youngster, knee high to a grasshopper, whatever those phrases you want to use. I remember my church, Riverview Alliance Church in Endicott, New York, every New Year's, the church would get together, all the families would come together on New Year's Eve. They'd play games and do things and celebrate and then bring in the New Year. But the parents would take their little ones, the, the, the wee little tykes, and put them in a Sunday school room about 9 or 10 o'clock at night, tuck them all in. They'd have their sleeping bags and everything. And then the parents went out and waited to ring in the New Year together. I don't know, maybe, maybe you can remember the first time your parents allowed you to stay up till midnight. And you would do anything that you could to stay awake. I mean, <laughs> as you can tell, I, I love my snacks, but New Year's Eve, I mean, you eat anything you can just to keep you awake till midnight because you want to be there to, to bring in the new year. Felt like an eternity waiting for 12 o'clock to be there. Once I got out of the Sunday school room and was allowed to stay up till midnight, you know, because then I was a big boy. I could stay up till midnight. Oh, come on, isn't it 12 yet? I'm tired. Now, at my age, I start saying that about 9.30. <laughs> I'm tired, I'm going to bed. And have you ever noticed when 
when that ball drops, I mean, you wait up till 12 o'clock, that ball drops, and it's kind of anticlimactic. Oh, okay. I remember the first time I watched the ball drop. And to me, in my dumb trucker mind, if you drop a glass ball with lights, it just shatters. So I'm sitting there watching TV like, I can't wait. This thing's going to explode. It comes down, just stops. What's up with that? But I guarantee you, the wait that we have to see Jesus will not be like watching that ball drop. One day, one day, we've waited. We've waited. You've probably all seen those Facebook things you click on. Just wait for it. Wait for it. Parable says, they became drowsy and fell asleep. Jesus is saying, wait for it. It's coming. One day, we will see Jesus face to face. Will we be greeted by Jesus with our lit torch and being taken to the marriage banquet? Or will we be on the outside of the door knocking? Wait for it. Wait for it. The interesting thing is, while we wait for it, and, and folks, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I watch the news and I'm like, God, I'm tired of waiting. Stop this madness. We live in a crazy world. Stop it. Put an end to it. Why does this evil take place? Why do good people suffer the way they do? But Jesus is saying, wait. If Jesus comes back today, there will be people that won't be in heaven that might have accepted Jesus tomorrow. Why do we wait? Because Jesus wants everyone to have that opportunity to accept his offer of forgiveness. But I want to close this message, and those are the words that every person in church loves to hear when the pastor says, I want to close this message. But I want to talk about a part of the, a, a phrase in this parable that I have to admit I've struggled with. And that phrase is, at midnight, the cry rang out, here comes the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And I struggle with that phrase because I was trying to determine exactly the time that that phrase is talking about. But then I remembered a phrase that one of my professors from Bible college taught me. He told me to remember, anytime you're looking at a, a parable, remember that it's only a parable. It's a story to give you a description of a bigger event, but it doesn't give direct explanation for each individual point. If the parable was just about when Jesus returns... I don't believe people will have that warning that is being talked about. They won't have time to say to the wise virgins, give me some of your oil. The Bible says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's done, gone, it, it's happened. Jesus is going to return. His church is going to be caught up in the air with them. So I, I don't believe that that midnight cry is just about when Jesus returns. I believe it's deeper than that. I believe it's about being ready because the bridegroom is going to be a long time coming. And if I look at it that way, that midnight cry is constantly going on. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus is begging people, be ready. Go now. Get your oil now. Get ready. Because it's going to be a long time coming, but when it comes, will you be ready? That midnight cry is right now for lost people. We're being told to not put off getting right with God. 
Don't wait for tomorrow, because there might never be a tomorrow. We don't know what will happen. Lives are tragically cut short every day. Today is the day to go buy your oil. Today is the day to make sure your jars are filled. Your time to meet Jesus could be today. Are you one of the wise virgins that are full of the oil of the Holy Spirit and you're ready to meet your maker? Or are you one of the foolish virgins It's going to be left knocking on the door? Folks, Jesus will be coming as our king. Will you be ready to meet him? That's what this story is all about. Whether you, it's when you die or whether when Jesus comes back. Let's pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to give you an opportunity to, to do some soul searching. I'm not going to ask for you to stand up or do anything. But I want to ask you today, if Jesus came back today, or you died and had to stand before Jesus today, which group are you in? Are you relying on your own strength and your own power, or are you relying on the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit? If you're not sure, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to, to pray silently in your head. You don't need to do it out loud. But say, God, I want to be, I want to be ready. Lord, I don't want to rely on my own strength. God, I need your strength and your help. Lord, I confess my sins to you. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. Because, Lord, I want to be ready. And when my life is over, I want to know that you are my Lord and Savior. If you prayed that prayer, get a hold of me after the service or send me a message. Pull Denise aside and talk to her. But Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. And Lord, we realize we live in, in a troubling world in troubling times but we serve an awesome God and Lord I want to be found faithful and when I meet you face to face I want to be able to hear you say well done my good and faithful servant Lord I pray that you would be with us as we go out of this church today we go back to our lives go back to the duties of the things that we need to do Lord I pray for your strength and for your help Lord, I pray that we would take the church with us as we go. Lord, bless us this next week in all that we do. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.